What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the State of Demand Gen podcast. This is your host, Chris Walker, and today we are broadcasting live from Boston, Massachusetts. First time in the new studio with my man, Gatano Donardi. Gatano, good to have you on the show. How are you? Yo, 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 what up? It's, uh, <laughs> it's always fun, Chris. You know, I uh, haven't seen you in a long time. I'm, I'm thinking it's been over a year at least since we uh, last met up. So. Yeah, and if you can remember, it was January of 2020 when we got together in Miami and chopped up State of Demand Gen 2020. And what I was thinking for this episode is we are going to rip it up. I think it's going to be a long (laughs) one for State of Demand Gen 2021. We're going to be looking forward. Um, A lot of stuff has changed, a lot of things moving. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to uh, get into that right now. So first question. Yeah. Do you think B2B Demand Gen has gotten harder or easier since we talked last? Hmm. Oh man, I, I feel like George Costanza's father right now uh, at Festivus. I got a lot of grievances with you people. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's gotten easier if you're good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's gotten harder if you're not very good. Um, now, I know that sounds kind of subjective. What is good and what is not very good? Um, and I guess we can get into that. But I still look at the number one North Star metric. Uh, for high quality demand gen programs is really lead quality. And then you got to tie that to some kind of number. It's got to be pipeline or opportunity amount, something like that. Um, Because as you know, the MQL has long been dead Mm -hmm. and, you know, we can talk about that too. But that's just kind of my opening thoughts, Chris. You know, if you're a seasoned sort of practitioner and you've sharpened your skills and you kind of went above and beyond and uh, you do more than just the basics, I think uh, it's gotten probably easier for you because you've gotten good. So that's kind of my opening statement for this uh, state of demand gen. Yeah, and I think some of the dynamics for people, we can go a little bit deeper here. Some of the dynamics that I'm seeing, events got ripped away straight away, which is something that marketers leaned on for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, Third-party cookies kind of moving away. away. Um, iOS 14, Mm -hmm. some of these new updates on iOS 15 regarding email. Um, marketers are getting a lot of things taken away that I think were kind of like crutches that were helping people that just helping people limp along. And Mm -hmm. I, so I think it's people will look back and it'll be a gift, but I think a lot of marketers are going to be challenged with this right now. Yeah, I I absolutely agree, Chris. Um, you know, what can I say? I think you nailed it right there. I think we can just get into maybe the next topic. Yeah. So what's one thing about demand gen that you used to believe that you think is no longer true? Yes. Um, and I don't think it's just me that used to believe this. I think it may have been the entire uh, marketing industry. But um, at one time, um, Google was, wasn't as big on themes. They, you, know, you could get away with more exact match. And I'm talking about really search right now. Um, really with organic and paid. You, know, you used to be able to make laser sharp long tail pages um, and you know they they wouldn't necessarily cannibalize themselves because Google hadn't quite gotten advanced yet with the semantic understanding of you know is Apple the fruit or the company mm-hmm. right and that's just a very basic example. Um, so I think Exact Match used to be uh, something that a lot of companies leaned on. It was easier and paid search as well. And now what you're seeing is Exact Match is getting very expensive. Um, And Google's um, AI machinery capabilities have really figured out how to get smart at bidding. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of over-reliance on exact match is really fading quickly. And many companies that are out there have said the same thing. So with SEO and paid search, exact match used to be kind of favorable. And now we're looking at a very different story. Yeah. And if you go a little bit further into, into paid search, if you look outside of branded terms and then you start to scrutinize that, I think generally what's happening is Google's becoming a lot more expensive. That is not the place where buyers are necessarily going in a non-branded search to go and find what they're doing. I think a lot of buyers are asking peers or colleagues, going into communities, going into social. And so that step in the process where people would normally not have someone to ask, they would go to Google and they would convert. Not seeing that much when you analyze it against revenue. Absolutely. And I think that kind of goes back to a common theme that we're going to see throughout this entire podcast, this conversation at least. And that theme is really, if you're doing good demand gen, 
everything else gets easier. And um, we always talk about this in the past too, Chris, but that demand creation versus demand capturing mm -hmm. thing, um, if you're good at demand creation, uh, demand capturing gets easier as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's just jump right into that one. We'll move back on the agenda. And so just defining, defining these two terms for people, capturing demand is people that already are solution aware and are looking for a solution. Your job is to, and they're looking on the internet with clear intent in those channels. Your job is to capture that. And then creating demand is for people that do not, are not solution aware, are not problem aware, and you need to move them through a buying cycle to a place where you can actually capture it. Um, historically, companies have been in the search and affiliate type of marketing where people are, where you're capturing demand, where that stuff is, are, where people are already presenting intent. And what we're finding is that if you're able to win further up in the buyer's journey, it makes capturing that demand easier because mm. the capturing demand is people are brand aware, not just solution and problem aware. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so let's talk about that. What happens when you ignore new demand creation and meanwhile, you've maxed out on capturing existing demand. This happens all the time. This is pretty much our target customer at Refine Labs is in this situation. We'll have to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so you know, I've lived that situation before. And um, you know, it gets really challenging because now companies decide, well, I gotta scramble somewhere. I gotta find the next untapped source. So companies can really throw some Hail Marys. Um, and I think that's kind of just a symptom of um, the way we've been sort of uh, spoon fed certain materials, if you will. <laughs> so there is kind of this, this sort of default um, to certain tactics that you know you and I have always discussed as, as not quite as effective today as they used to be. Um, so maybe we can riff on that for a second. Yeah, I mean, when, when I'm looking at uh, companies that have maxed out capture existing demand, what the what the current playbook of what companies will do is they'll just try and spend more on those channels, which ends up having you know dramatic diminishing returns as you continue to spend more to try and get more out of them. And the fundamental difference is that when you're going to create demand, you can't be going into it with a captured demand mindset. And measuring it like that too. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that's what's tough, you know. Um, and you hear this a lot at, at companies when you, you start maxing out on uh, existing demand. Mm -hmm. There'll be this desire to, to quote unquote get top of funnel. We need more top of funnel. How many times have you heard that? How do we get more top of funnel? Where's the top of funnel? Even sales leaders say, it. where's my top of funnel? Yeah, where do you think that comes from? Oh gosh, you know, I think, Again, a lot of it comes from like they read a HubSpot article and they think we need top of funnel now, you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, a lot of companies already have top of funnel, um, but what they're, what they're probably not doing is obsessing over tracking every single little minuscule thing. Mm -hmm. And so that top of funnel awareness may be there, it just may be in part of the dark funnel. And maybe we should get into that. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get into it for the people. We've been talking about the dark funnel a ton obsessing over this is how it needs to change your actual execution and measurement in marketing to lean into this reality as opposed to resisting it. I feel like a lot of companies are sort of like swimming upstream on mm -hmm. a really, really strong current of a river and uh, it'd be a lot easier to, as they say, get on an inner tube and fly down the river instead. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, what's your experience with Dark, Fun Dark Funnel been and, uh, and what can people learn from that? Yeah, I mean, I think podcast advertising is kind of the go-to example there. Um, you know, you hear Ahrefs talking about this. Now, Ahrefs, they don't spend any money on paid search, yet they invest very heavily into podcast advertising, essentially in a, a very hard to track um, mm -hmm. advertising channel. Um, and the reason why they continue doing it is because they monitor qualitative feedback and they see in qualitative feedback, oh, I found out about Ahrefs on a uh, podcast I was listening to. Or um, he said when conferences were a thing, were a thing uh, he'd be approached. Uh, I'm talking about Tim Solo, the mm -hmm. CMO. Um, oh, I heard about you guys on this podcast. Um, you guys are awesome. And that's how I checked out Ahrefs, right? And so when you have those sort of qualitative insights, um, you can start to kind of feel mm -hmm. this is working. And then, of course, is revenue and pipeline just kind of trending in the right direction over time? Mm -hmm. That helps too. <laughs> so maybe we could riff on that part, Chris. Yeah, I mean, if you're a, a demand gen team in 2021, you need to be aligned against qualified pipeline that's marketing sourced and marketing source revenue. Track that growth over time 
and then correlate it with the activities that you're doing inside of the dark funnel. And what if for capturing existing demand, what are you hearing qualitatively about specific channels? Are mm -hmm. those things working? How do you go harder in those channels to get a correlated result out? Mm -hmm. And I think that marketers, because they're just so straight line attribution, 2011, yes. um, struggle with the idea of connecting the dots between yes. we've posted 50 days in a row on LinkedIn and now our pipeline is growing, but I don't see it in HubSpot. So what the fuck are we going to do? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you know what else, Chris, a lot of people, they kind of, they default to this idea that the only way to get true qualitative feedback is to survey customers, <laughs> right? Now, of course, survey customers is always a great idea. Um, it's the default method, but you got to start getting creative and getting outside the box now. How about if you have channel partners and resellers? They're often a rich source of information. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people tap into that. Listen to sales calls, talk to your sales team. Mm -hmm. That is a rich source of information. And now let me tell you something else about uh, the voice over IP unified communications technology category. It's converging into the gongs and choruses of the world. Mm -hmm. Think about it. If you got call center software, it only makes sense to get AI analyzing behind you know, the transcripts and the voice and everything that's happening on these calls, package them into insights. Now gongs market got a lot more competitive real quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the convergence of tools is another thing that's happening in B2B. We could riff on that too. Mm -hmm. Other places to get qualitative insights for people are communities where your customers hang out and social. Mm -hmm. So that could be one in the same, right? Facebook groups, LinkedIn group, Slack channel, Reddit, Discord, mm -hmm. um, across the board, there are plenty of places to get qualitative insights of what your customers are asking, what they're saying. Um, and when I say customers, it could be people that are your ICP and don't use your product as well. I want to loop back because uh, one of the questions that we had asked was one of the things that you uh, thought about Dimension that you used to believe that you feel is no longer true. And so I'm going to jump on this one and see what you think, which is the idea that marketing's job is purely to supply sales with leads. I think that a lot of people in the 2012 to 15 timeframe thought that that was what demand gen was supposed to do. I think there's a lot of people listening to this podcast that still think that's what marketing's job is supposed to do. And I want to provide a really interesting example in a different space. And so the, the example is, imagine that you're a direct to consumer, like food company that sells through Whole Foods, right? And so if you look at this example, the marketing department in this is marketing for B2B and the sales component is Whole Foods, right? And in this setup, the marketing department is basically responsible for selling the whole thing so that somebody shows up in Whole Foods and buys the stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what marketers in the B2B space need to get to where the place where you are basically trying to move someone all the way to a sale, not moving them 10% of the way done, collecting the lead and calling it a day. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, I agree with that a hundred percent. Now, um, <clears throat> when I, when I think about, um, how sales can make this kind of easier on marketing as well. Um, there was this idea that should sales have some sort of marketing activity quota, right? Should sales be held more accountable for marketing activities online, right? Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, how do you kind of evaluate how active they are? Do, are they going to be required to make a certain number of posts on LinkedIn, for example? Do they have to get active on Twitter? Do they have to find a community where, as you mentioned, Chris, their buyers may be uh, chattering about the product, services, and brand? Mm -hmm. What I've found is that the best salespeople do that anyway. Do that anyway. They do that anyway. And for most, for any <laughs> for company that that forces that activity, that experiment will fail. I know for sure because yeah. of the way that the companies measure that, that people will do the activity. They won't have some type of direct measurement to be like, oh, this is working. Yeah. And then they're just going to give up and go back to cold calling where they have direct, you know, type of measurement across those. Yeah. And, and you know, it doesn't make it any easier when there's softwares out there that are basically telling you to spoon feed it a bunch of links and it will give salespeople automated ways to just blast out content with no context or story or meaning or narrative or point of view or perspective on any of it. Mm -hmm. It's just pure noise. And they're paying those companies tons of money who, who have those softwares that do that. 
And it's just another example of like how you can really be wasteful um, in, in the world of B2B. I, I, that's actually one thing I wanted to comment on too, Chris. I noticed there's a lot more waste than there's ever been before. Mm. And, you know, the idea, at least when I was like um, at Pipedrive, you know, we wanted to be efficient. Mm-hmm. Now, that was in 2016, granted, but, you know, we wanted to be efficient. Now I feel like efficiency is like really like going away, mm-hmm. especially in industries where you have monster behemoth companies and they just want to grow at all costs. I mean, they're blowing money like water um, and it just makes it really tough for the people who actually want to be efficient. Those companies that may be mid-market and growing, mm-hmm. um, it's tough to compete uh, when, you know, the behemoths are gobbling up leads at any cost per acquisition that they, mm-hmm. that they want. So it's tough. Where do you think the waste like mindset comes from? It's not their own money. They never had um, Mm -hmm. a business before or they never really managed their their own personal budget in a way. You know, it's like it's easy to spend other people's money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to say I need 50K on a webinar um, when it's not your money. I think it's also attributed to um, it gets it gets um, encouraged based on the measurement. Big behemoth companies are 100% measuring on MQLs. Mm-hmm. They have not changed that yet. It's It would be very mm-hmm. hard to do that because they have all the infrastructure underneath it. And so they're measuring on leads and then they just chalk up that budget to a fixed cost. I want my, I want my leads. Who cares mm-hmm. after that? Which creates a ton of waste, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the way that I kind of see it, which is why you would see smaller companies or companies that needed to be you know, was going up against the behemoth. It would be really smart if you were a com- company that was 50 million ARR competing with a billion dollar company to be a lot smarter with how you use your right. marketing dollars. Absolutely. And, and that's the only way you're going to have an edge against those big guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Where do we go from here? <laughs> so uh, let's talk through this idea of brand and demand. And so okay. what I've uh, what I've been sort of like getting close to recently is the idea that perhaps when companies normally have branded demand as two separate functions, not a ton of collaboration, um, brand focused like on fluffy analyst relations, PR, maybe Mm. they'll put together a podcast Mm. and then demand, which is just pure like MQL hamster wheel stuff. Mm. And the idea that perhaps like the right solution is to actually have both of these functions work together. Um, under one leader because if you were able to do that and you actually recognized how if you had a paid demand engine, real mm-hmm. demand, not lead gen, mm-hmm. and a brand organic motion working together mm-hmm. that you could see uh, accelerated exponential type of gains by having those mm-hmm. things together. And I just don't feel like they're coordinated enough to see that right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. It's like it's like vinegar and olive oil, man. Um, you know, it, it really, it's tough. It's a tough mix. Mm. Um, it's first of all, you know, it's different skill sets. If you really think about it, um, when you have demand gen marketers trying to work with like fluffy, fluffy corporate brand marketers, it just doesn't really mix well. But isn't that the problem? Like, isn't the, isn't, the isn't, <laughs> isn't, isn't that the problem we have like, like hyper, like math focused people and yeah. then hyper fluffy focused people. I think just, meeting in the middle is the right solution like we shouldn't have fluffy brand marketers we should have brand marketers that are doing brand that are with customers because it drives revenue yeah yeah and and you know i don't want to sound like i'm bashing brand marketers you know because it's tough out there too brand is just getting very hard and you know it's not just about what can we throw big bucks at um and get like a billboard going or Mm -hmm. you know you can't have a, a, a superstar sort of mega price tag um, campaign going unless it's supported year round. You got to have a cadence around it. You got to have a theme. Like you can't just throw some <laughs> massive number at something and, and hope it works. I've been in situations like that where it's like, hey, let's sponsor this really big thing. But before that, there was it was ghost. Mm-hmm. Like there was no build up. There was no sort of media cadence at all. And it was like, damn, we're, we're ghosts right now. We need to make a big bang. And so you throw a bunch of money at like one thing and it really is underwhelming actually. It underperforms Mm -hmm. and everybody was so gung-ho like, oh man, this is gonna be huge. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see branded search spike and like we we saw a little bit, right? Um, But uh, I guess what I'm getting at is 
unless you really plan this stuff out, um, as you were saying before, Chris, you know, the, uh, one thing that happens is they just throw more money into the same channels. Mm -hmm. um, this is just throwing more money into just an unknown channel without much support to go mm -hmm. along with it. And I think it's a rare person that'd be able to oversee and do both and see how they work together, but they're out there. And I think that's a really interesting thing for companies to think about is how do you find that one person where both of those things have some type of like uh, effect on driving each other. Yeah. Now to go a little bit further on this, to get a little bit more specific, what do you think the role of corporate comms or PR is within the context of demand gen? Should those, like how do those functions work together? What's some example of things that they could do? Um, let's go into that. Yeah, so I think there's a type of crossroads if you will or sort of you know the two ovals overlapping and that little center piece is where the two worlds kind of collide um and to me that's kind of like that data driven journalism so you want to have like really an seo objective or some kind of growth or referral traffic or new referring domain growth objective that's always like a really good component um and then on the flip side of that um this is where you kind of have that like ooh, did we get a lot of reach um, did we get a lot of social shares, for example? Mm -hmm. um, if there's video content, how uh, deeply was that video content consumed? What's the average time on page uh, for the asset that's being promoted, right? Mm -hmm. Is there co-promotion uh, and co-marketing with some other brand, for example? So all these kinds of things working together, if it achieves some kind of you know referral traffic, maybe referring domain growth, SEO, um, goal mm -hmm. that's great and then it has the other stuff too on the brand reach side that's great if it gets a narrative out there that's great mm -hmm. but in order to make all those things happen with one campaign it's really tough because mm -hmm. you need some superstar dynamite home run grand slam content <laughs> and that kind of stuff is really hard to produce um i've seen some examples of cybersecurity companies publishing like the most common passwords that get hacked, right? Um, broken down by state or whatever. And then they draw like, you know, common themes or mm -hmm. insights among that. And that becomes really juicy, consumable, shareable, heavy hitting content. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what you, what you alluded to earlier was that too much corporate brand marketing is just, hey, let's do analyst, relation, analyst relations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's buy an expensive package uh, with some analyst firms and do some, I guess, uh, you know, uh, where they gate the, the study and like they, they write about you and you know, that, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I was going to say when you were mentioning all the metrics that you were talking about, like referral domains, um, increased branded traffic, all those different things, I was going to say, I don't think that a lot of corporate comms executions actually achieve that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I love the idea of data driven journalism. I think that's, what's really kind of moving in order to do that, you need some true experts inside of your company. When we use the cybersecurity examples, there's like a CISO in there that's doing that stuff that's yeah. not working as a chief information security officer for the brand. They're acting as a subject matter expert on the marketing team, mm -hmm. which is a massive change in mindset for a lot of companies. Um, but you need that type of caliber of resource in order to pull this off, or it's gonna be like every single other ebook where you have a marketer writing to a CISO, and it's just not gonna hit, or an agency writing to a CISO, or um, those types of things. One, a couple yeah. of places where I think this can work together well, and I've at, we actually do this a lot here at Refine Labs, is the idea if you had a good corporate comm strategy, how you could target and amplify it through demand gen and paid. So we just released this new product or this new, you know, report came out that says that, you know, we're better because of the X, Y, and Z reason, or um, I'm trying to avoid the money raising one because it's not really helpful for, for buyers, but you can get the eye sense of what I'm doing. Mm. Take that a company would normally make a press release about it. A couple of people would see it. They'd share it on organic. Um, I'd argue that a lot of the people that actually see that are not your customers and then figure out how you can repackage that distributed mm. it, targeted to produce that news for your customer. Um, right. the data driven journalism, you could do the same thing. It's just a district, I think a more effective distribution strategy. You mentioned one thing in there that I want to go deeper is the is the state of analyst firms. And so I've been seeing this mm. a lot, um, seeing it a lot because we do a ton of qualitative market research across CMOs about like, what do you like about working with these types of companies? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people, what was the, um, the statement that basically you're just like, they're bribing you mm. for, for some amount of, of money to use their, the quadrant or any of those things. I'm not here to, to call any specific firm out. 
Um, and so I just want to know, what do you think are the benefits and the drawbacks of that thing? I also saw a note on G2, which I thought is an interesting parallel that I've been actually talking about quite a bit of that analyst firms used to be a source of trusted information a long time ago. And I think that consumers now have access to a lot of other options that they might trust more, G2 being one option, but just pure word of mouth, I think, being the main one. Um, and so do you think that puts analyst firms in a bit of a pickle? Okay, very interesting topic. Um, so I think these analyst firms, the very top ones at least, have done such a good job over the years that I don't think they're going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon. I, I, I do think they're still a force to be reckoned with. Um, they definitely command enterprise level respect. Yeah, especially in the enterprise. Especially in the enterprise. Um, um, I would even say among technical audiences, I mean, they just, they hold a lot of weight. They, they really do. Um, and I don't know if I see that changing anytime soon. We'll, we'll see. Um, you know, I don't think it's all bad. I think there there is some like merit to like, you know, getting in that game. And then it's all about, like you said, Chris, the distribution. Like, how are you leveraging those assets? Mm -hmm. It's really easy to just slap it on your homepage. I think that's kind of the go-to default tactic. It's not necessarily a bad one, but it's just kind of go-to default. Um, we can talk about other ways of distributing that um, that collateral, if you will. But I guess back to the main point. Um, I agree with you. You know, um, sinking a ton of money into all that stuff should not always necessarily be the default. Hey, let's just do this because our competitors are doing, or everyone else does it, or this is just kind of the default playbook thing to do. Um, I agree that marketing teams that try and get more creative and get into that brand uh, demand creation mentality mm -hmm. are going to win in the long run. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm about to get into a pretty, I think, a pretty juicy part of this chat. And so okay. the way that I see it, if we're looking truly at the state of demand gen 2021, I think there's four or five key places that I would have marketers focus. Um, so those would be podcast and content, but I think podcast is a huge lever given uh, the content that's created for several distribution channels, organic social or paid social, both community events, buyer experience, those things drive word of mouth in the market. Mm. Would love to get your sense about, uh, about those topics and perhaps I missed some. Yeah, I mean, we should get into it. I think the one thing they all had in common is that they're not very easily tracked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they all kind of qualify as part of that dark funnel. Now, what was the first thing you said again, Chris? Let's go back to the top. Podcast. Podcast. Okay. Yeah. So podcast, I think, is kind of a no-brainer. Um, now, here's the challenge, though, with, with podcast. You, like, let's go back to the subject matter expert thing. If your world is technical and complicated, you also have to make the decision, do we want to have a tech-focused podcast where we get into, like, hardware discussions mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, SD-WAN? <laughs> Or do we want to have a softer sort of more top of funnel or general um, brand podcast, if mm -hmm. you will, um, and go beyond those technical topics and make it more consumable to reach, a, to reach a wider audience? So back to the idea of like know your audience, know what kind of like sizing you're going for. Do you want to be narrow but hit those tech probably in market consumers, but there's probably not as many of them out there as you think, mm -hmm. or go just like really big and wide and try and get that word of mouth hum effect going. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one decision that will have to be made. And both, both can work, right? Yeah. I think that, um, especially with technical audiences, I think sometimes people use it as an excuse, but I would argue that the people that listen to this podcast are technical audience. We're using acronyms. We're talking about stuff that most people don't know. Sure. It's a technical audience here. Um, and I believe I actually, I know that you can make it interesting without it being about like just talking about SD WAN hardware, right? There's ways to weave it in and make it more interesting for people. Jumping to uh, to social, I had a pointed question on, on social, which is number two on the list here, which is why do most C-level executives not have a, a, pr a social presence is, is like, why, why do you think that's happening? Oh, okay. I think, um there's a couple of things that just come to mind immediately. One is that it's really hard to have a good social presence nowadays. Um, everything supply and demand. Supply and demand. I mean, if you think about saturation of channels, it's at an all time high and only getting higher. You should have been taking advantage of the LinkedIn algorithm while you had the chance. And yeah. now it's too late. Now, of course, uh, you, Chris, for example, have uh, milked that cow for all it's worth. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. It's you just, did a job and, well done. And just so people can rewind on this, it's it, I didn't. 
the only thing that I did was recognize the opportunity and fully commit to it. And be so there's two components, mm -hmm. being able to see the opportunity, which most people didn't see, mm -hmm. and then being able to actually execute on it, mm. right? And so if you can get those two pieces in place, I encourage companies to start to think about that in terms of their talent and their IP and the things that they're working on. You might have missed LinkedIn, but what's coming next that if you were ready and you saw it that you could actually capitalize on, I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to think about organizationally. Absolutely. I mean, agility and swiftness is still a marketing superpower in today's day and age. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many companies now are just moving at a turtle's Too pace. Too slow. Um, I get it. You know, there's um, bureaucracies in place. There's processes in place. I get that. 20 approval layers for a campaign. I, yeah. You know, I get that. But how can it be more simplified now to empower demand gen marketers to move through execution more efficiently mm -hmm. um we need to make it easier remove i think you need to have like addition by subtraction you kind of need to remove a little bit in order to move faster love that um and you know autonomy is really the theme chris mm -hmm. autonomy is the theme my that like the, the guys and girls that i work with my team they're phenomenal because they've adapted my autonomous mindset mm -hmm. we have kind of core objectives and goals but they have choices on what they can work on it's not like, all right, I want you guys doing this, 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 this. I want them to have a brain of their own and make their own decisions. Um, and so empowering them to also make decisions is going to just move things faster. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. I think one of the reasons maybe why C-level executives don't have a big social presence or are just pretty much not there comes down to the idea that they grew up in a time where it was mostly B2B sales, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the, the CEO didn't have that level of responsibility. And we've moved into a place where it is about B2B brand. And so there's two things. Either they haven't made that transition to believe in it, therefore they haven't moved on it, or they're just not good at executing it because their mindset isn't in that place. And so I think those are the, the two places why executives don't necessarily do it. Would love to hear what you think. So I actually agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, the commitment factor is huge um, or the lack of ability to commit or the reluctance mm -hmm. to commit because it is a program, you know? In fact, I would argue that you need to treat like brand, CEO's brand as a special tactical unit. As if it was your conferences. Absolutely, like, your it needs to have a full-time person on it. It needs to have budget behind it. This person's gotta be able to do multimedia level content across different channels, has to be a master at distribution, chopping, popping, mm -hmm. scripting. Um, it's gotta, you gotta be like how the president has like a script kind of ready for him mm -hmm. um, with the teleprompter. I mean, it doesn't have to be that level scripted, but I think you get what I mean when I say that the CEO, uh, his, his or her personal brand should be managed like a product. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going on this list yeah. here. So we got uh, community, which, and uh, what's bucket events in there too? Cause I almost see uh, if you, if you do events well, you sort of as a, secondary components start to build a community because people love the events they love coming they love the people that are there they all see the world the same way or, or where it's going so we'd love to hear um what are the things that you're seeing in that specific camp as it comes to driving pipeline and revenue for a company right so the basically the role of communities in revenue yeah so as most people know but some people may not know um I used to lead the marketing um, at Sales Hacker. And this is the most classic that I can get as a classic example, but um, you know, Sales Hacker was, and I think still is, kind of that go-to source for B2B knowledge. I think what was special and still is special about Sales Hacker is that it's focused on like tactical. Uh, it's, it's just as tactical as it is strategic, but I would even argue a bit more tactical. And so it's for those like people who really are trying to get better. Mm -hmm. So when you have that like sort of commonality amongst like, all right, we're really, you know, 
trying to get better. We're all in this, like, we want to better ourselves, level up, get to the next level of our career. So career content was huge. But tactical content um, across all these different various tasks that salespeople have to do on a daily basis. And then we expanded out the content strategy to be demand gen, um, marketing, rev ops, you know, kind of customer success, kind of just get more broader. You don't want to be stuck in that narrow thing with B2B sales. But anyway, the whole point is that why would outreach acquire a blog? Right? Like a tech unicorn company, why would they acquire a blog? <laughs> you got to sit and wonder, mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, they probably recognize that they can retarget off of that traffic. Genius, <laughs> brand, hello, this is everything we're talking about, right? Um, and also um, access to visibility and new eyeballs. There's just a constant stream of new eyeballs because of the SEO engine and content engine. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the organic marketing flywheel is just buzzing at such a tremendous pace. I would say we had this webinar engine, which is still running today, Organic social, the things you always talk about. We didn't really put too much money into boosted, promoted content. We, we, we did some of it, but it wasn't a huge factor. Mm -hmm. It was really other companies promoting us, co-promoting us, doing campaigns with all sorts of, you know, I remember Clary, Chorus, Gong, even Salesforce and HubSpot. You know, mm -hmm. we were doing campaigns like left and right. So um, I think I'll just pause on my rant on yeah. that one. We could break down some of that you, stuff. There's you, some good. You, <laughs> you mentioned one thing that I want to go deeper yeah. on, which is the idea that of the um, absence of a lot of tactical advice for whether it's salespeople or marketers. I think if we frame the conversation for marketers here, there's a huge gap, right? Like if you think about the one that I, the example that I use often is the ABM example, okay. which is basically like top level framework with not good advice at the tactical level, which creates, I saw um, a, a recent poll where it was like 43% of people, the number one struggle they have in, in ABM is measurement and proving ROI. And I'm, mm, I'm, I'm really starting to think it's not, because they can't, it's not because they can't prove ROI, it's because there is no ROI. Mm. Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, um, I'm gonna just talk from like what some things that I have seen happen. Um, whether it's my current company or companies I've consulted for or just what other demand gen marketers have shared with me. Um, so I think like a lot of ABM strategies nowadays are kind of conducted in like pods, you know, there's like pod structuring. So it's more of a coordinated like sales and marketing effort, which is really cool. Like most marketers, you know, they, they, especially if they're not in like big enterprise B2B, they're probably doing more spray and, and, and prey tactics. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing ABM marketing, it is actually kind of cool to have more of that targeted, strategic, you know, coordinated effort with sales, um, which is pretty sweet. So you get to work on things like messaging. You get to test things like templates and sequences. Um, and, you know, you get to just test all sorts of cool stuff and you can apply it to your marketing as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you're kind of doing like sales and marketing together, um, which is, a, a, I think, a key difference between like why ABM just may be um, one of the ways that companies are gonna try and go up market with their marketing efforts because mm -hmm. you know, you're not gonna be targeting small deals if you're doing ABM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the challenge that a lot of companies face is it's way too heavy on the sales component of the sales and marketing side. Mm -hmm. Um, and my belief, and I think that it's proven out there that just a much more methodical execution of marketing will drive better impact than having two groups do sales. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, here's, here's a lot of what, what will happen sometimes is you'll have the sales component down, but then it's like, then they'll just say, Hey, marketing, we need air coverage. Mm -hmm. And then you'll basically just run display ads run, to accounts run display that, ads. that never get seen. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, they'll get seen very little and they won't probably have much impact. But I think this might be a good time to tell you, Chris, when something works on me, why I analyze it and something worked on me. Um, and now this is going to be an enlightening moment, I think, for a lot of people and companies. And you talk about this a lot, but it's the notion that paid advertising, uh, particularly on social, is becoming more like SEO. Now you might think, wow, they're two widely different things. What the hell could they have in common? And what they're starting to have in common is the amount of persistent effort that you need to put into the channel before you start to see returns. 
So the duration of which you persistently and consistently, you know, keep up the activities, but you test along the way. I'm not mm-hmm. saying you don't change anything. And to the, to the actual like impact at the buyer level, not at your leads, leads. right? And so yeah. if you ha- if you actually think about as a buyer, like how many touches, how many of those things do I need to see until I remember the brand, know what they're associated with, know what problems they solve, and then actually think about considering whether or not to buy, um, there's a big gap there, right? So continue to talk yeah, to no, the story. Huge, yeah. huge gap. Anyway, long story short, um, I've been getting targeted like crazy on Instagram uh, by this company called like Secret Miami or whatever. Now they got two things right. I like live, uh, I like live music. I'm a musician and I'm in Miami. So they got those, those two things, those two dots connected. Now I've seen this ad, no lie, hundreds of times. And every time I skip it, I skip it, I skip it, I skip it. And then like one night after seeing this ad for so long, it easily had to be like two months straight. Now they use different creatives and stuff mm-hmm. so that it wouldn't get stale. They use a mix of like videos, um, you know, st- still images, GIFs, whatever. Um, and then finally one night, like two months later, I was like, all right, let me check this out. And I finally clicked it. Now I didn't buy anything, but at least I know now in my brain that they exist and what they do. It's a, a candlelit concert series. So now um, I have that in the back of my mind and I may show up and buy someday, but they'll never Mm -hmm. have the attribution. Mm -hmm. Or you might ask somebody else that lives in Miami that likes live music, whether they've been or not, which creates word of mouth. And Mm -hmm. again, no attribution on that. Um, So many interesting things that we see inside of our own data in terms of level of time and what people really need to think about as marketers is the idea is you're not gonna take someone that's never heard of you on paid social on an Instagram ad to buy, become a lead and buy your product in one touch. And every single paid strategy is built around that system. It's frustrating. Um, it's highly frustrating, but I mean, back to the point of like, people are going to look, it's noisy out there. Okay. It is just plain straight up noisy, saturated and cluttered. And so it takes more effort. Now the level of effort required to get your message and brand in plant it into someone's brain is just simply requiring more effort because attention spans have gotten lower. Cognitive ability to like absorb things online have gotten lower. Mm -hmm. And so you have to get more creative with how can I create thumb stopping content, things that are going to stop people from scrolling. Mm -hmm. That's really tough to do nowadays. You really got to think outside the box and, and try some things and get, get it right. Yeah, and I want, I want people to do the math on this real quick. So Facebook and Instagram ads, let's just say on average $10 CPM, 100 impressions. It costs this company $1 to have Gatano know way more about it than ever before. And we have SaaS companies that are giving away $100 gift cards in hopes that somebody sits on a demo to get basically the same information. Wow. Wow. Just- just the impact, like the idea of that companies continue to try and optimize to push someone into a demo so that their salesperson can tell them things versus just marketers just telling the market that. Like, like where are, where are we on that? Yeah. I, you know, Chris, it keeps coming back to this theme again of like doing really good actual demand creation. Mm -hmm. Um, and it looks like there's this sort of like parallel or commonality between the dark funnel stuff and demand creation. 100%. The demand, that's what the theme of this episode is really about. Good demand creation is mostly around hard to track activities. And so that's why uh, companies are the most reluctant to do them, but the irony is that they have often the highest ROI. And so if you're one of the companies that can think outside the box and actually break the chains, break the spell, of the hamster wheel, um, you know, MQL thing going on. And you can start to get outside of that and think deeper, longer, more ahead. Um, that's top of funnel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You may not be able to track top of funnel, but top of funnel is happening. Um, this is where this is going, Chris. That's, this is where it's going. This is where, if you think about the brands that you love in any discipline are executing this way, right? Like, we're not in we're not in love with the brand that's spelt, that spends a million dollars a month in Google search ads and that's a majority of their marketing budget. Those are often the brands you don't even know never, about or remember. Never heard about never heard vendor, of vendor four if they're even considered. It's so bad. Yeah, so it's so bad. 
we're gonna make a hard transition here before we get into the topic this is just a little bit of a pause i don't do this very often but it needs to be said it's just a shout out to all of the marketing ops people mm. um if you are a demand gen marketer um go and just give your marketing ops team a high five next time after you listen to this episode those people are doing some incredible work um they make demand gen way easier when things are in the right place where the data is tracked well where you have the right reporting while you can integrate the tech while they're a real partner um to marketing ops and to the cmo um just wanted to take a second and just shout out that group because i don't think they get that nearly enough um i've been um and we work with 30 companies right so we we are um we work with companies that have i would say best in class mm. rev ops marketing ops um, where all the data is flowing, you ask a question, you get a visualization, like not ad hoc reporting, but like true work about, okay, how are we going to measure this stuff in the dark funnel or how are we going to do this? And so people that are really smart. And then on the other side, we work with companies that I would say are pretty immature in terms of marketing ops to the place where they don't even have tracking on the source of some of the opportunities, which makes it incredibly difficult to optimize your marketing. If you don't know where your opportunities are coming from, optimize your company. If you don't know where your opportunities are coming from, and so uh, the question that I want to get into right now is um, what is the role of marketing ops specific to demand gen and what happens when marketing ops doesn't support that well? That's a great one. Um, so marketing ops and demand gen ultimately um, they need to make a decision on something. And the decision is how do we continue to think about these channels in terms of what's working and what's not working? Where can we get more? Where are we tapping out? What's happening in each channel? Marketing ops has sort of the machinery to help you make those decisions. And so it's not that marketing ops needs to be order takers from demand gen. I want to make that part clear. Totally. As well. You know, and a lot of demand gen marketers, they unfortunately can fall into that trap where it's like, I need this crazy data point or this crazy set of data points. And maybe you do. Um, but just like marketing ops should not tell demand gen tactically how to perform and how to operate, we should not necessarily be telling marketing ops what we think the solution should mm -hmm. be. We should be giving them the problem and then allowing them to kind of reverse engineer that problem into the solution that makes best sense for this particular situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think um, you gotta see a little bit more of trust, collaboration, um, and just working through complex problems together. Mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you say are some of the um, best qualities of a marketing ops leader? Yeah, so I think, um, you've got to be able to actually get into the mind of a customer. Mm. I think that's a big, big gap in marketing big gap, ops. big gap. Um, because like one danger in ops is you may get too kind of attached to the, to the mentality of dollar in dollar out data, data, data. It could be data, data, data. Um, they may be partnering a little too close at the hip with finance and this is a tough part for marketing ops. They're often sitting in the crossfire between demand gen saying, I need spend, I need this, I need that. They're on the other side trying to justify that to finance. Um, and now there's this sort of awkward back and forth that happens. And they get often caught in the crossfire of a lot of complex situations. Demand gen with tool requests, right? Now guess who's got to go evaluate those vendors and tools? Often marketing ops and demand gen should be helping and doing it too, but that's just another huge task you put on their plate. Then they got to get the financial clearance after. So uh, <laughs> shout out to the marketing ops folks. It's not easy out there. You're, you're definitely in a tough world uh, between machinery, you know, software, implementation of new technologies, data, insights, reporting, finance. Mm -hmm. It's a tough, gritty, nasty world out there for marketing ops. Mm -hmm. I, I salute you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, to get a little bit deeper on the mind of the customer, I don't think this is just a marketing ops challenge. I think that um, when it presents as a, as a marketing ops challenge and not having the side of understanding the customer, you get too focused on data, data that's telling you the wrong story. Mm -hmm. um, but the same thing ex exists for demand marketers and brand marketers. The only one that's probably 
clear in the clear of this for the most part is product marketers. Ooh, and so, yeah. um, like just hammer home this, this idea of like, you gotta be in the mind of your customer. We're in, we're in a completely different world here. I, yeah. So, I mean, getting into the mindset of a customer, um, I think it's really hard to achieve this. Um, people are busy and they're caught up in their day to day routines and often getting into the mindset of a customer requires you, um, to pause like your daily kind of routine activities. Like you have to make time for this. This is something that I, you know, it can, I guess it can be forced, but you should truly be making time for this. You should be creating time for it. It's that important. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to be talking to customers. That always is the best and preferred route, of course. Now there are some complexities that come along with that, but for the most part, it should be easily achieved. Um, you can also listen to sales calls. I think that's part of getting into the mindset of a customer, playing with the product, giving product feedback, and hopefully they're receptive enough to work with you on you know, implementing some of those feedback changes, right? And so getting into the mindset of a customer is actually trying the product, using the product, even creating some kind of scenario where you can use it in a daily uh, life manner, even if it's something just simple, even if mm -hmm. like it's a basic function of the product, it doesn't have to be a complex setup. Um, that, that should be sufficient enough. And then just, you know, trying to get as close to the customer as you can and getting out of the sort of day-to-day -day rabbit, rabbit hole, rabbit race, rat uh, race. I would argue that the fundamental definition of marketing is being in the mind of your customer, connecting the business to the market, right? So there's, there's, an, there's an output, right? Like the actual like marketing, the shouting, but there's actually an input too that most companies see where you need to connect what's going on in the market back to everything else in the business. I think it's a really interesting component now. Right. I think we're about to approach what might be your favorite part of the episode here. So <laughs> oh, gosh. We're, uh, we're in 2021. And a lot of people listen to this podcast, including you, know my thoughts about SEO. Um, and oh, would, love to, wow. uh, would love to talk about what's changing in okay. the world in SEO for you, maybe over the past 18 months, um, it'd be helpful to sort of like also look back at sort of like the, the golden era, so to speak, which might've been like a little while ago. And so we'd love to hear, uh, yeah. just help a lot of people out that have been working on SEO. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot that's happening in the world of SEO. I think, um, there's some exciting things happening for sure. Um, now you have like a lot of, um, chatter on Twitter, especially around some of the latest algorithm updates. That's, that's something that's always happening. And the common theme that I have observed when um, there's an update is that Google is making an update in a way that's going to make things more convenient and better for the end user. They don't really care so much about your website, right? They, they care about what the person searching for something lands upon. Mm -hmm. And so one of the uh, components of, you know, the updates and where Google's going, there's this concept called core web vitals. And so in the most basic plain English, what that means is the page cannot take too long and be annoying. It can't take too long to, to load and it can't be, you know, ridden with pop-ups and big, yeah, poor user experience things. Right. Um, you know, uh, they time to first paint. They look at stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? How long does it take to actually paint the page mm -hmm. up? So um, that is one direction. Now, the other direction in SEO is that um, you need to really consider the type of content experience you're creating um, when you're going to undergo the uh, process of creating some content in order to achieve ranking. Some results now are just loaded with um, sites that you can't break. <laughs> so YouTube. If if the results are loaded with videos, you are not going to rank with a landing page, mm -hmm. period. I mean, and so you need to do like that sort of situational, you know, analysis before you go into the process of creating content. Now, um, this is where a lot of companies certainly fail. They can't figure out, well, you know, it looks like most companies um, that are um, in this result are Gartner, G2, Trust Radius, Captera, and like some other aggregator site doing the top 20 best XYZ tool. There's no chance you can even break into that, period. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's like that for a reason, because 
people know that marketers lie. And so um, the problem is that I don't, want, I don't even want to say lying. I want to say exaggerating or mm. people don't trust vendors, right? People don't trust vendors. They trust their peers. Mm -hmm. So Google knows that if you just have vendors ranking for all these crazy expensive software terms, it's just going to be a comparative advertising bloodbath. And so the shift has been towards the way people want to buy. They don't want to see you in certain stages of the funnel. Mm -hmm. They want to see their peers. They want to see um, sort of unbiased, hopefully unbiased mm -hmm. information. And so um, that is a really important thing to consider in SEO nowadays, like especially when trying to do like bottom of the funnel demand capturing SEO, which is arguably what is the most important part about SEO when it comes to revenue. Like that's yeah. the closest dot connecting thing to revenue. And that's often what companies want. But there's this halo brand effect too that you can achieve with SEO. Um, there's this audience development component of SEO that you can achieve. You can break into new markets with SEO. You can get new visibility in adjacent markets with SEO. You can attract certain kinds of buyers to your website that you initially didn't have mm -hmm. with SEO. It all depends on what you're trying to do. And this goes back to social. This goes back to brand. This goes back to really product marketing. Like, what are you actually trying to do? Like, what is the main objective? And that has to hopefully come clearly, you know, clear marching orders from the top <laughs> levels. You know, hopefully the uh, general or, or uh, commander in chief is sending clear marching orders. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's just kind of my rant on, you know, SEO and kind of where it's going in 2021. Yeah, I got an interesting question on Dem Demand Gen Live a couple of weeks ago um, and would love here to kind of like talk through and expand upon it. The question was, um, but can't you create demand in SEO? And my response was, no, I'd be interested to debate this. I said, no, you can't create demand inside of SEO. All you can do is redirect existing demand from one thing to another, but something happened to get someone to go in there yeah. to make that search, which was some level of demand. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I think you can measure the effectiveness of brand creation or demand creation with some SEO stuff, right? Like you can look at branded search. Mm -hmm. That's SEO is kind of responsible for branded search. It's not like we just ignore it. Like one goal of SEO should be to increase branded search traffic. That's a mm -hmm. no brainer. <laughs> so, um, yeah. that, you know, I think that's a lot of, a lot of SEO programs, especially B2B SaaS, they often will ignore branded search. They'll be like, oh, we got to rank for like CRM software. And, um, they'll just totally forget about like all the branded mm -hmm. things that are out there being searched for, which oftentimes when you fall asleep at the wheel there, guess what, guess what's going to happen. You're going to have results there that are not maybe going to be accurately representing you editorially. It may be throwing people off in their decision-making process. You may not even be aware of it. So th there's some really important things here with, with brand. I think maybe we can pause there and riff a little bit, but <laughs> that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you do the whole revenue al analysis to revenue, look back at your leads and do a look back, what you'll typically find is the three biggest converting sources are organic search, direct traffic, and branded paid search. And so if you look at those three things, uh, usually we see somewhere between 60 and 80% of marketing source revenue comes from those three channels, which ends up at some type of high intent conversion on a website. The organic search component of that, I would argue is heavy on brand to a direct conversion as well. And so you have, yeah. you have direct traffic, AKA somebody knows your brand goes directly to your website. You have a huge chunk of organic search, which is branded search, and you have branded paid search. It's all about brand. Right. No, I mean, I agree totally, totally. Um, and dude, this has been consistent with um, what other demand marketers have told me. Um, this has been consistent with my previous experiences and current. You've, you know, the, so I guess getting back to the original point is like, can you do demand creation with SEO? Inside of SEO, right? Inside of SEO, can you create demand? I think you can support demand creation but I don't know if it can solely be done with, with SEO. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a part of SEO that's very top of funnel. It's like, I wasn't even thinking about you and I saw you, mm -hmm. you know? And also dude, like there's a lot of companies now coming out with lists 
that are actually very influential, at least in terms of discoverability. Mm -hmm. So if you can get at least like, let's say HubSpot puts out like, you know, best um, call center software as an example, that's actually a pretty legit uh, site. HubSpot, well known, pretty well trusted, right? If they've got a list of top, uh, you know, CRM software mm -hmm. or call center software, that's got to hold some kind of weight. Um, yeah, but so, they need to, the, at the to, in order to get to that page, you need to be looking for top call center software usually, right? That's and right. so that's, it's, it's taking existing demand of a category and then pushing it to a vendor, um, ver <laughs> exactly. right? Versus ver the creation. Ver versus where did that, when, when the search happened, what drove that search, right? right? Which right. is probably word of mouth, organic, you know, content or some type of social activity. And so that's where <laughs> I think people, you know what I mean? We're all yeah. leading back. If you want to create demand, we listed the channels out here, which are, are ironically the most effective as well, just requires a little bit of a different uh, a different mix. Now, yeah. we might be coming up on the close here, but there was one topic that I had in a Demand Gen Live episode recently where you shot me an email back and you were like, we, we're we probably going to need to talk about this. Okay. And I'm not sure if you listened to the statement, that, that, like the full on, but I'll just pop you the title and you'll be like, whoa. Okay. Is My belief is that you don't need SEO to win in 2021. <laughs> that's hilarious uh you know um so i caught a lot of flack uh if you will on linkedin uh from this guy who wrote the book play bigger um christopher lockhead i think he's actually a pretty cool nice guy he's quirky you know i, I respect that I, I respect individuality as you can see you know the way i present myself is not with any sort of thought of what others may think of me it's just truly raw who I am, this is what you're gonna get. So getting back to Christopher Lockhead and uh, Play Bigger, right? I actually had posted that I thought category creation is the most overrated thing in B2B marketing. And the response was overwhelmingly positive, like most marketers actually did tend to agree with that statement. However, I did have some challengers and uh, hilarious, Chris, Christopher Lockhead changed his LinkedIn um, like profile overview section and he just put overrated in quotation marks. <laughs> I thought that was pretty hilarious. We had a little back and forth on that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, getting back to like the whole sort of like, do you need SEO? Is it truly necessary? It, I would say it depends, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no blanket yes or no answer on this. If you are in an industry that has very low or zero search volume, then you don't really need SEO. And there are some situations where that's the case. Like your product is just so abstract. There's no name for it yet. Um, even if there was, it would be super low, insignificant, you know, amount, like it would do essentially nothing for your, for your bottom line. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't really need SEO if that's the case. Um, and that's just one clear cut example of, of when you probably don't need, we definitely don't need in my opinion, if there's no search volume around your stuff. Yeah. Um, unless you purely just want traffic for retargeting and you just want to just build traffic. But, um, <laughs> so what I, I, the, the example, um, it'll be interesting to go in this cause you'll probably find some nuances that'll help me understand this better okay. is I just pulled up on SEMrush, the keyword overview for marketing agency. Okay. Right. And so over here, refine labs, if somebody was going to make a generic search, they would probably make that search. There's 18,100 searches with a 62% difficulty. We spent so there's volume, like what you mentioned, we spent zero time on it, continue to grow really fast. Like how would you kind of like put all of that together? I think the keyword volume is an interesting one, but if there's high keyword volume, there's going to be a lot of competitiveness. And so instead of competing over there, I would just rather go create demand for, for what I'm doing. Yeah. So I, I once ranked myself for like SEO services. Like I got my own website to rank and the kinds of people that were contacting me, it was just like trash 99% garbage. Right. And so this is a classic example of like, you cast a super wide net, right? Now you, Chris, as you know, driving refined labs, really their whole marketing strategy of the company rests like mostly on your shoulders. But I see now the rest of your team chipping in and I'm seeing refined labs everywhere, which is great. Um, but, uh, gosh, you know, going back to the SEO thing, um, 
just like marketing agency like you know if you're if you rank for marketing agency you're not going to get anything that you want because <laughs> <laughs> it's just the truth it's just the truth it's not it, it comes down to distribution like it's the wrong method of distribution that's mm -hmm. what it comes down to like your target audience doesn't search google for when they need demand generation consulting that's just what it straight up comes down to mm -hmm. like most people have a certain way of finding a solution for a certain problem and in this case, you know, finding a complex solution like demand generation consulting, especially, you know, I would say you're, you're aiming to be in that top five percentile of quality service provider, really white glove. Mm -hmm. um, that's just not the kind of people out there who, who search. They just ask like their peers, like they'll reach other C-level executive peers of theirs at other companies mm -hmm. and they'll say, hey, I have this problem. Or they may be even in a forum such as uh, what's the one revenue collective. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask for, you know, feedback through Slack or Thursday Night Sales is another community that was created by Scott Lees mm -hmm. uh, and Amy Volas. And they have technology forums in there with huge audiences talking about tools nonstop all day long. Yep. And, and the interesting thing to think about is, is that just what people are moving to? Mm in order to like right there's probably some solutions that weigh higher or lower on the scale but i think generally over the past five years more people are doing that than searching generic like right. generic terms right now i will say this it won't hurt you to rank for marketing 100 <laughs> percent. it won't yeah. hurt right? it can't hurt like hey it gets the name out there great because yeah. guess what this is the way search works now and we're seeing this in paid right um, you cannot predict, it's really hard to predict the kind of buyer that's going to come through on a big volume, g sort of really generic term, right? Like a lot of that stuff is good for like brand building and like domain authority boosting and mm -hmm. referring domain growth driving sort of activity, right? Like if you rank for marketing agency, you're probably going to get a lot of backlinks, referral traffic. You're going to be on a lot of lists. Mm -hmm you're going to be out there more, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get good customers out of it because mm -hmm. the distribution is just, it doesn't align with where your target audience hangs out. Yeah. Um, another like little note on SEO, a lot of that part of the conversation was driven on enterprise SaaS, not product led. If you're product led okay. uh, with lower ACVs and not a lot of expansion opportunities, you're going to want to lean into organic. One of those options would be SEO. I still believe when executed properly, organic social might actually be the better option for you today. But that was just a little PSA for people. Cool. G, we are uh, heading up to the end. But before we do, you got a couple questions you want to throw over my way? Yeah, I mean, let's 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 do a little riffing, man. So let's get back to the to the um, to the classic sort of sequence of marketing activities that happen with respect to top of funnel. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to go with the sequence of, you know, potentially a, uh, a third party site running a display ad on your behalf or sending an email blast on your behalf to some sort of lead magnet content. Um, and it's gated behind a form and it's got the standard classic fields and you through that promotion of that asset, you, you capture a lot of, um, contact information, mm -hmm. right? You have that contact information over a period of time and now you want to start to make use of it. What do pretty much 99% of companies do? They send you um, automated email sequences and then potentially even call you if you click on enough links or if you open enough pages or if you um, visit the site a number of times because there's EBM softwares now that will um, track all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess where am I kind of going with all of that? Um, there's a there's a clear point I wanted to make, Chris. I think that people need to um, when they're when they're moving in this direction. Maybe you can catch on your thought while yeah. I go in this. Yeah, is we need to start thinking about as a marketing, you know, collective of the idea of combining both fit and intent as to whether or not we're going to pass things to sales. And no, I'm not talking about intent data from Bambora. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about somebody visited one page and then you're gonna hit, they're gonna get an MQL score and they're gonna go through. 
about the idea that people say, hey, I want to talk to your sales rep as a component to whether or not it hits some type of score that marketers then optimize for. Yes. Um, I'm not seeing that right now. And so if you look at all the top of funnel activities, one, a lot of them are using a third party vendor, whether it's an agency, content syndication, a trade association, any of those third party you're paying. And so when you have a third party relationship, the, that party is incentivized to make sure that everything is tracked, which means that it's transactional, which means that it's short term, which means that they're going to try and optimize for lowest cost per lead, which means lowest intent at the same time. Oh. And so you have this relationship where because the relationship is built around measuring stuff so that you could prove things mm. that you're actually not getting the exact thing you want out now that you look at revenue instead of leads. For a long time, marketers had you know, their head in the sand being like, oh, we're getting a bunch of leads. This is all I want. I either don't have the tech to track it to revenue or I just don't track it to revenue. Um, and so when it comes to a lot of those top of funnel type of programs, that's what I see. And now here's what we should get into a little bit is what is the alternative, right? Like what is the alternative method of let's, they, they love to use this word nurturing, lead nurturing. What are, what are some uh, alternative methods of lead nurturing outside of the email automation hamster wheel? I think this is we kind of this, a, we do this yeah. full on at refine labs with an event, a live event every week that 60 to 100 marketers show up to, sometimes multiple events a week. We get people from EMEA, APAC, US, everywhere. So weekly event, podcast three times a week that you know, 15, up to 15,000 people listen to now, organic social content across an entire team of demand marketers that a bunch of people are seeing. You mentioned on this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, we use email as strictly a way to get people to events and distribute information around that. And I'll try to like nurture people with content or different things like that. Yeah, I, that was an interesting thing that I picked up on. Uh, the Refined Labs email strategy is fairly rudimentary and it's by design. Mm -hmm. I never get um, unwanted messaging from Refined Labs. Mm -hmm. I only get, ooh, this is kind of interesting. Maybe I'll check it out. And so put those touches together, yeah. right? An yeah. event a podcast, LinkedIn, you know, five to seven LinkedIn touches from me yeah. and a bunch of other people across the team. That's a modern nurture program in right. the dark funnel. Right, right, right. And right. then as a B2B SaaS organization, put paid demand marketing on top of that across Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and you got a really, really good system. The problem, measurement. Measurement. Yeah. And so, so, oh gosh. Now I will say this. If you are a B2B marketer, it is damn near impossible not to see your Refine Labs uh, content on social media these days, uh, particularly LinkedIn, um, because I don't know many people who are hanging out on Facebook anymore. That's gotten kind of stale. I mean, there is Instagram, of course. Mm -hmm. Twitter has picked up steam in my view. Yeah, I'm um, seeing that too. I'm, I'm using it more. Oh, dude, I'm all about it. I think that's where you get like um, the most idiot proof content. You know, you get some really like good stuff there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Got time for one more. You want to just close it out? Uh, I think we, I think we should maybe riff on one, one more, Chris, if you're down, um, your, your, the way you guys treat email is so unique. It's so, it's so, um, it's unconventional, mm -hmm. right? Like y there's no sales objective. Mm-hmm. And so like that, yeah. there's, no, there's nothing more to say. There's nothing more to our, say. Our intent is not to use email to send people emails that they don't want so that we can try and achieve our business objective. We send emails to people that they do want that helps them get into content, which then helps them learn stuff so that when they learn stuff, they might consider buying our thing, which is the strategy across all of the different channels for people, which marketers don't understand because they need to prove specific things out of certain channels. And just generally, marketers are way more focused on transactional stuff, which is yeah. why email marketing has got into that direction. So some people would say that it's uh, unconventional or rudimentary. I think it's just being uh, understanding of where what buyers want yeah. in that channel and it's then end just user adapting. Focused. Yeah. yeah, it's totally end user focused. Now, <laughs> why can't companies do this? And, and let's get into that part, man, because it seems fairly obvious that if you don't annoy people, um, and you just give them stuff that they want that they'll probably end up buying anyway if it's the right fit and 
you know, it works, right? Yeah. Um, I would say two core things. I think one is a lack of understanding about how people buy things today and a lack of understanding about their buyer in general. And then there's the second thing, which is a lack of questioning the things that people have been doing since 2009 about whether or not we should do this anymore, <laughs> right? right? And so the, I think the benefit to Refine Labs and why we've been able to grow pretty quickly is the idea of looking at some of the things that most companies say we need to do this and saying we don't need to do these things. Just like I mentioned about the SEO thing, we don't need to do these things, right? So it might be right for some companies, you got talent and strategy, like you guys develop all your own things. I'm just trying to present some points that some people think are facts, which we don't follow, which allow us to do the three or four things um, really well and in the right way. And then when we adjust our measurement to how much pipeline are we generating every quarter? How much revenue are we generating every quarter? And we see seven quarters up and to the right that we're like, hmm. Something's so, working. Something's like, seems like this strategy is working. We should probably keep going here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. You know, back to the measurement portion, it's like you also need to understand how the business performs when a certain type of customer comes in. And you should understand your performance against certain types of customers. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the world of commodity products, you're often looking at line sizes or a number of seats, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it often tends to be the case that as line sizes go up, complexity of the deal increases, and then usually sales close rates decrease. Mm -hmm. And so what often happens is marketers spend the most amount of time on the lowest line size opportunities and the easiest ones to close, but the lowest value but they don't really um, think about, all right, well, how can we work with sales to include, uh, to improve our close rates on those higher mm -hmm. value opportunities? Because you get into the hamster wheel syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. and it's hard to break out of those habits. Um, but it, really the point is what the, all the things you're saying about the measurement and the mindset shift that should happen within the measurement mm -hmm. of demand gen. Everyone. We are at the conclusion of the State of Demand Gen 2021 live from Boston, Mass. Katano, it has been a blast. Uh, I Thank think you. it's about time we get out there, get a lobster roll, go get a steak right. dinner. Get, <laughs> it's 90 and sunny out there for people. It's going to be a blast. So uh, it's been great having you up here again. Good to see you. And uh, let's do it again next year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for Fine Labs team for having me. Um, what can I say? You guys are doing great work, and I'm happy to be a part of this episode. So thanks again for having me. Hell yeah. Peace out. Peace.